recording list here now. And uh, at this time, um, why don't we go through and, and quickly introduce our, our panelists and uh, Jennifer, I'll have you lead us off there, please. Sure. Uh, thanks, Jason. Hello, everyone. Thanks for being here tonight. Um, I'm Jennifer Stanley. I'm the Northeast Region Education for Colorado Parks and Wildlife uh, based out of our Denver office. So I'm excited to be here and glad we can come together for this webinar and this conversation. Thank you, Jennifer. Joe, you want to go next? Officer Nich Nicholson? Yeah, certainly. Uh, my name is Joe Nicholson. I'm the wildlife officer stationed in the Evergreen District. Um, I've been in this district for about 11 years. Uh, I basically helped cover from, oh, Morrison uh, to the Continental Divide and, uh, you know, as well as going down into Park County, some of Gilpin County, um, West Jeffco and Clear Creek County. Thank you. And Lori. Hi, everyone. I'm Lori Morgan. I'm the Northeast Region Volunteer Coordinator, and we have a lot of Bear Aware volunteers. So if any Bear Aware volunteer questions come up, I just wanted to be available to answer any of those. Okay. Thank you very much. So leading us off tonight, Jennifer Stanley is going to uh, present some information for us. Great. Um, okay, so I'm going to try and share my screen now, Jason. Okay. And let's get it into the full. Okay. Um, and just a thumbs up if you can see my screen. Okay, perfect. Thank you. Okay. Let me just get this organized. Okay. Um, so I'll go ahead and get started. Uh, so again, welcome everyone um, to our Bear Aware uh, presentation and conversation tonight. Um, I'm going to start off with a presentation and it'll be about 15, 20 minutes. Um, I'm really going to focus on black bear conflicts, um, why they happen. So what drives the bear behavior behind them um, and what we can do to prevent them or stop them um, from happening, um, you know, either originally or if you're having problems now, what can we do to help get that turned around? Um, all of that good stuff. So we'll talk some biology, but we're really going to focus on these conflicts, um, why they happen, where, and what we can do to stop them. Okay, um, so like I said, tonight's all about human black bear uh, conflicts. They happen all up and down our Front Range area from Fort Collins all the way through Colorado Springs, even to the border. Um, and Evergreen is no exception for that. So if you live in Evergreen, it's probably not a matter of if you're gonna see a bear, it's more of when you're gonna see a bear. Um, so you're definitely living in black bear country in Evergreen. Uh, and it's important that we learn how to live responsibly uh, with these animals and how to share this space uh, in an effective way because they're, bears have always been here, they're here to stay. Um, more and more people are coming into our state and the Front Range is a great place to live. And so that development and people are here to stay as well. So we're gonna have to figure out how to do this better together. So let's start at the beginning. Um, and how did we get here? So how did we get to this point where we're having these conflicts um, and these things are happening between humans that live in Evergreen and the bears that live there as well? So just to throw some numbers out there, about 30,000 acres of a year right now of habitat is lost to development. So that's a lot of natural area. Um, all of that area is space, shelter, food, and water for this wildlife. Um, when we put up our neighborhoods and our cities and our shopping malls. Um, so these bears have always been here. And as we continue to kind of chew up this land with development, they have nowhere else to go. Um, and in fact, they can turn to the neighborhoods and cities and they're finding food sources like bird feeders and trash cans and pet food and hobby livestock. And so um, that's part of our issue here is that sharing the habitat, sharing the land. Um, also between 2017 and 2018, about 80,000 new residents came to Colorado and that's from the US Census Bureau. Um, and I just wanna impress the point that these are residents, people who are coming here to live here. They are not traveling here, they're not visiting here. 80,000 new residents that live here. That's a lot of people. Um, and so we're seeing these conflicts on the rise more and more and with mild weather, 
um, shorter winters, mild spring, um, this kind of bear season as well has gotten a little bit longer when they're out and about. Um, and then the last uh, number here is that Colorado's population is estimated to be about 5.7 million people. So again, we have a lot of people on the landscape and we have a lot of black bears on the landscape and it's only natural that we're gonna come into contact with each other, okay? So let's talk about why these conflicts happen in the first place. So we're going to start with bear behavior. What is driving these bears to do what they do? Why do they come looking for food so often? Um, and really the answer to that question is hibernation. It's an extreme lifestyle. I like to think of it like an extreme sport um, as well for bears. And this is their solution to surviving winter without having any food source available. Um, and it's tough to survive hibernation. A lot of things happens to bear uh, physiologically that they have to prepare for during the rest of the year. Um, so really that drive to find food, what they're looking for, how often, how much they need is all driven um, by their solution to surviving winter, which is hibernation. Uh, so let's talk about hibernation a little bit. So fall feeding, uh, really when bears start to kind of kick into gear to gain the weight they need to survive the winter, they start feeding 22 hours a day. Um, and they get into this behavior we call hyperphagia, which is compulsive overeating. So for 22 hours a day, they are looking for food to eat, to pack on the pounds, to get the calorie and the fat they need to survive winter. Um, so bears need about 20,000 calories a day. That's what they have to gain uh, to survive hibernation. To put that in perspective, that is the same as eating 37 Big Macs a day, uh, which kind of makes my tummy hurt, but I think it's a good analogy. Uh, so that's a lot of calories. Um, so they just eat, 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 eat. And they are looking for easy food sources that have a ton of calories and a ton of fat. Um, things that are easy to get to, they don't have to expend much energy to get those food sources. They don't wanna burn the energy. Uh, they wanna keep those calories for themselves. So during hibernation, um, a bear will lose 20 to 27% of its total body weight, uh, which doesn't sound like much, but again, if we break it out, um, I think it becomes a little more meaningful. So for an average male black bear that weighs 275 pounds, 20 to 27 percent of their body weight is 74 pounds. That's equivalent to two and a half cinder blocks worth of weight. That's a ton of weight that they're losing. For an average female at 175 pounds, that's 47 pounds that they lose just by hibernating. So those 20,000 calories a day, they really need to get through that weight loss and get through that winter to get to the next spring. Um, also during hibernation, their heart rate and their metabolism is going to drop 50 to 60% from their normal rate, which is remarkable um, that they can survive that. So if you think about your own resting heartbeat, uh, mine has always been a little bit high. I'm probably around 70 to 74 beats per minute. So that 50% drop is almost going from 74 beats per minute to about 40 beats per minute, um, which is crazy to think about. So hibernation really is an extreme lifestyle and it's what's driving the behavior for these bears to eat, eat, eat. So um, let's put that into a picture and start to map out how this behavior of getting ready for hibernation, trying to survive winter, um, pushes them into conflicts with people. Um, and so this is just a little map that I created as kind of a nice graphic. And if we start here in the green, when bears emerge from hibernation, remember they haven't eaten since maybe November when they went in. So they're slowly starting to wake up. They're slowly starting to get back to their normal um, body processes. And this is about March, April. So again, weather can affect hibernation. If it gets warmer earlier, they could be out earlier than that. If we have a cold, uh, heavy, wet winter, it may be a little bit later. But generally, March, April, we start to see bears coming out of their hibernation. Now, we all know in Colorado that our weather is totally bipolar, right? I mean, just look at this last April. We've had wind. We've had 80 degree days. We've had snow. Um, six inches, I think, was the last snowstorm we got in Lakewood. Uh, so that weather is going to change. Um, and what can happen is if we get a late freeze, it can actually come in and destroy 
destroy some of the berries that maybe have started to grow and kill off that natural food source. Now you have bears on a landscape that are looking for a natural food source that isn't as abundant as maybe it should be. So that can be one thing that will drive bears into neighborhoods. If the spring goes well, when we get into the summer, so May, June, and July, uh, we all know what the dog days of summer are like, especially in the last couple of years, we're getting up to 100 degree days on a regular basis in the summer. Well, that's gonna affect food sources on the landscape. So if we get droughts that come through, again, the natural food that's left on the landscape for bears just isn't there anymore. Um, and they're still trying to gain that weight um, and get what they need to get before winter comes again. Okay, so if we have a drought, now these bears, they're hungry um, and they really need to find a food source. So they come into our neighborhoods um, and our cities like Evergreen. And what do they find? They find bird feeders, they find trash cans, they find pet food, they find hobby livestock. Um, there's a lot of things that they can find that works for them as a food source. So now you have bears coming in, spending time in neighborhoods, getting comfortable with people when they shouldn't be. And this is what sets up the potential for human black bear conflicts. Okay, so they start finding these easy food sources, um, bird feeders, trash cans, um, and for them, life is great. Uh, they start to get more comfortable. As you can see, this bear here says, thanks for that easy meal. We found what we needed. We're good to go. So as we move through the summer and now we start to get into the fall, this is where the real trouble begins um, because bears now stay in our neighborhoods. So if people aren't doing things like hazing bears or deterring them, and I'll talk about that in a little bit, they have no reason now to leave our neighborhoods. They start to lose their natural fear of people. Um, they become habituated is the word that we use. Um, so bears staying in neighborhoods, readily available food sources, um, now they're becoming too comfortable. So now we get into October and we get to that time period of that hyperphagia or that compulsive overeating that bears start to get into to get that 20,000 calories a day, those 37 Big Macs a day for up to 22 hours a day. Okay, so now they're comfortable in our neighborhoods and they're here sunrise to sunset. Okay, um, and bears that start with bird feeders and trash cans, if if they don't get scared away by people, what can happen is their behavior is going to escalate and they're going to start looking into sheds, garages, and then eventually going through someone's kitchen window because they're becoming more and more comfortable with people. So that's where we get to this piece right here. So these habituated bears start breaking into garages to find more readily available food sources. Uh, things like the breakfast burritos you leave in your freezer or the ice cream that you keep out there or the pet food that maybe is near the window in your garage. Okay. Um, and then these bears eventually make their way over to a house and they might go through your kitchen window for the bowl of peaches that's there because you left your window open an eighth of an inch in the summertime. The bear caught the scent of those peaches and goes right for them. Um, and what happens in this situation is really unfortunate because now that's a dangerous bear. Nobody wants a bear coming through their kitchen window at two o'clock in the morning. That's not a safe situation. It's not what we wanna see. And so now that bear is gonna be put down because he's considered a human human safety threat. So this graphic is just to, meant to be an example of how we go from hibernating wild bears to a bear that goes through a kitchen window um, that now is not going to maybe survive the season. And what we see at Parks and Wildlife is we typically get the phone call about bear behavior at this point. At the very end of this chain of events and behavior is when somebody calls Colorado Parks and Wildlife and someone like Joe has to come out and put this bear down. The reality is CPW can come in way back over here um, near the beginning of this chain. So if you see a bear in your neighborhood knocking over bird feeders and trash cans, call us, report it. Let us know. Uh, simply reporting a bear in your neighborhood doing things like this is not an automatic death sentence for that bear. At this point, that bear is considered nuisance and we can turn its behavior around through deterrence like electric fencing and hazing like banging pots and pans together, uh, using air horns to scare it away. And then it'll never get to this point, okay? CPW could also come in 
at this point here to do education. So webinars like we're doing tonight um, to get around and share information with your communities, uh, flyers, brochures, door hangers, all that kind of stuff. Uh, we're here to support you and we wanna get the education out there and we wanna get the tools that you need out there so our bears can stay wild and free and never get to this point because they never get too comfortable with us. Okay, so now we know how we got to this problem. So let's focus on minimizing these human black bear conflicts along our front range and in Evergreen specifically here. So what we don't want. Um, so these are just some simple pictures of what it looks like when a bear uh, gets into a vehicle or a garage or a beehive. So this picture here on your left hand side, um, a bear got into a vehicle, it could have been for anything. It could have been for the six month old French fry that was under his seat. It could have been for the cherry chapstick that was left in the cup holder. And he went right for it. The door locks behind him, the bear can't get out. And this is what your vehicle looks like the next morning. Um, a simple fix for this, lock your doors on your vehicles anytime you go to and from. Um, this picture here is what it looks like when a bear gets into your backyard beehives. Um, again, there's a simple fix here with electric fencing. It doesn't hurt the bear. It just gives it a very clear message that this is not where you want to go to find food. Okay. Um, our next picture is what it looks like when a bear goes through a wooden garage door. Uh, they can and do um, do this. They are strong enough to get through that wood. I've even seen some pictures of them going through metal garages. Uh, so they're very strong, powerful animals. And again, that drive to get the 20,000 calories a day uh, while they're feeding for 20 hours a day, it's very, very strong. So they were gonna try and get to those easy, reliable food sources. And then this final picture here, um, if you can see this window on the, on the right hand side, that's the window the bear came through into someone's kitchen. Um, this looks like maybe a cabin-like property and it just rooted through everything and it destroyed everything. And again, we don't wanna ever get to this point or this point or this point or even here. All of this is preventable if we work together. Um, some other things to put in perspective why these food sources are so appealing to bears is this calorie counter. So if we start at the top, um, if we look at their natural food sources, one pound of berries is about 2000 calories. So they're gonna have to work pretty hard and collect quite a bit of berries to get to that 20,000 calories a day. Oops, sorry about that. There we go. If we move on down this first one, so seven pounds of bird seed is 12,180 calories. That's a ton of calories. So a bear would really only need two seven pound bird seed containers and they're already over 24,000 calories. And maybe they haven't even left the yard yet of one house. Um, and I know that houses I've seen that have bird feeders tend to have three or four or more on the property and a bear is gonna hit every single one of those um, for those calories. If we look at dog food, so a 25 pound bag of dog food is over 42,000 calories in one sitting. A 28 ounce jar of peanut butter that maybe you left in your trash can um, and put out the night before pickup, he's gonna get 4,750 calories out of that can of peanut butter. Um, and then the four ounces of suet, that's just as important as seed feeders or hummingbird feeders. So the suet blocks that usually uh, woodpeckers will go after, that's 968 calories per four ounce block um, of those. So it's a very, very high reward for bears. They're not having to burn a lot of energy to gain a ton of calories, um, which is why it becomes so appealing. And once a bear finds out, oh, I can go into backyards and break into five or six bird feeders at a time and maybe hit a trash can, it's going to hit every other single house in that community or neighborhood looking for the same thing. Okay. So when we talk about living responsibly with bears, what does that mean? What is that supposed to look like? And the first thing we like to share with communities is please take your bird feeders down um, from April to November, which is active bear season. Bears are out and about doing their thing. And when we say bird feeders, we're encompassing all of those. So seed feeders, suet blocks, and hummingbird. A uh, hummingbird is pure sugar water. So imagine the fat and all that sugar. Um, instead of of using feeders to attract birds. Uh, we asked, you know, use native gardens, um, use flower pots. 
in a flower pot hanging off your deck, if it is a blue or not, not blue, an orange, a red or a pink tubular flower, hummingbirds are just as likely to come to that as they would to a hummingbird feeder hung with a bunch of sugar water in it. Um, bird baths and nest boxes can also be really great ways to attract birds naturally that won't attract bears at all. They're not gonna be interested in those types of things. Um, there is also some research out there that says if you use things like native gardens and flower pots and nest boxes, you'll actually see more of a variety of species of birds. So rather than seeing say 20 European starlings at your feeder, maybe you'll see four or five different species throughout the day using the habitat. Um, if you must feed birds, uh, and we understand that birds are a really great way to have a backyard connection to your local wildlife, um, what we ask you do is do it during the winter while bears are in hibernation. So roughly from November to March or so, um, bears are gonna be in hibernation, they're not gonna be active. So you don't run the risk of attracting them into your yards um, like you would during the spring, summer and fall. Um, but there are some uh, guidelines to, to even doing that in the winter time. So things like uh, clean up the spilled seed and shells, Bears are not the only wildlife that will come in for a, a seed feeder. I've seen deer come to them. I've seen coyotes come to them. So it's important to keep all of that cleaned up so you're only attracting birds in the winter. Um, you still wanna bring those feeders in at night. Raccoons will go for them as well. Uh, so again, it's just that being responsible and mindful. Avoid using the open platform style feeders that tend to be really messy um, and clean your feeders often. Um, of course, we don't want to spread any disease or anything like that among birds or other wildlife. So for trash, um, trash storage, there's a couple simple things you can do right now. Um, you can store your trash in a bear resistant container, uh, which looks like this over here. This is an example of what we have um, at the agency. You can freeze smelly trash uh, until morning of pickup and simply put your trash out morning of pickup. Um, putting your trash out morning of pickup can reduce the chances of having bear conflicts by about 70%. So that's the easy, simple thing you can do that doesn't cost you any money and it's gonna help your bears. All right, and then uh, this, will, this will be my last slide. And um, I always like to talk about save a life, don't feed wildlife, including bears. Um, animals that are fed become demanding and dangerous, sort of like our cartoon over here. Uh, he's got a cute mask up, um, but really he's still wildlife that could potentially be dangerous to you. Um, and he's just trying to get something from you that he wants. Uh, concentrating animals can lead to the spread of disease. Uh, we never wanna see that happen. Um, feeding can change an animal's natural behavior, like uh, they won't migrate out of an area. Um, again, that habituated bear can escalate that behavior. So they may start at the curb with the bird feeder in the trash can, um, but they will eventually move up to the shed, the garage, the house, and that's really what we don't want. Um, and feeding big game animals, including bears, is illegal. So this is something that Joe could give you a ticket for, um, especially if he comes by once, gives you some education, asks you to do these things, and then he comes by again, it hasn't been done, you have another bear problem, um, you can actually get a citation for that. So it is illegal in Colorado. So we just ask that you live responsibly with wildlife, with your bears, um, so that we can share this landscape in a way that benefits both. And that'll be the end of my presentation. So Jason, I hope I didn't go over time. No, oh, thank you very much, Jennifer, that was very good. Thank you. And I will stop sharing my screen as well. Okay. All right. Well, uh, I'm going to follow up off of Jennifer's presentation, um, defining conflicts and, and why bears are coming into conflict with us with some of the data behind it. So as hang tight real quick, as I will share my screen next and some of you may have already seen the, uh, the data that, that'll be presenting here, but this is breaking down the bear reports that come into us. Okay, here. All right, so hopefully everyone is seeing my screen here. Jennifer, can you give me a thumbs up if you're good to go? Okay, thank you. All right, so when we get calls um, from the public reporting uh, bear conflicts, bear sightings, 
um, whatever that instance may be, that is data that we track. And we put it into our uh, reporting database and that is very important for a number of reasons. Uh, one, over time, it can help us analyze trends uh, on a yearly or localized basis. It can help us analyze some of the problems that may be going on. Um, so that information, when it gets reported to us, is extremely valuable as wildlife managers. And we can use that to help out on the local community levels. And even maybe in a bigger picture scale, we can define what the problems are and what can be done to address them. So uh, last year in 2020, CPW received 4,943 reports of bears that were called into us. And that number was down a little bit from 2019 when there was 5,400. And the different areas that you see here, the 18 on the bottoms, that kind of separates geographically where they come in. And so Colorado Parks and Wildlife separates the state into 18 different areas. And, and we are run off of four different regions that you see on the map here. Uh, Evergreen is incorporated in our area one, which encompasses uh, Gilpin, Clear Creek, Park County, and portions of Jefferson County. So as we go through this numbers, as we go through the data, um, we'll be kind of showing the area one uh, level that we get to, in addition to the, the statewide level. Um, and the idea behind that is just to give you an overall picture of what bear activity is like in Colorado and, and the conflicts statewide and both locally where you are at. So this is uh, the complete breakdown of those 4,943 reports last year. You see the area columns on the, on the left, um, the number of reports that go with them. And then we get into some of the different attractants or, or conflicts that are associated with these reports. So uh, about 5,000 reports last year, uh, 5,400 the year before, both of those years, all those calls that we get, one third of all calls are affiliated in one way or another with bears and trash. Uh, as Jennifer had mentioned, you know, bears need to pack on the calories and they want to spend the least amount of effort to get that. Uh, an open trash can is an extremely way, easy way for bears to get a high reward with little effort. Then we move in next to bird feeders. Uh, last year, we had 411 reports that involved bird feeders. That's probably a very minute uh, amount of what actually takes place across the state. Again, these numbers are how they're reported to us. Um, but a bird feeder, a trash can, very, very easy calories for a bear to get into. And it helps us to find the problem. If one third of all reports uh, involve bears and trash, then that's a telling picture right there. As we move on to some of the other attractants, you saw the picture Jennifer had of, of bears and beehives. Uh, chicken coops are another one that are a large source of attractant uh, in the area one region and statewide. And just as Jennifer mentioned about electrifying your beehives, you need to electrify that chicken coop to keep bears from, from getting into that. Livestock. Livestock is a, uh, a, you see the number statewide, 391 reports is one of our other largest attractants. Um, and some of those that, that we report, llamas, alpacas, sheep and goats are, are some of the main ones, um, but also livestock feed. Um, so you need to be able to secure your livestock, secure your livestock feed from bears that will get into them, bring them in at night, keep them in secure pens, um, and do other aspects. You know, you could work with your local wildlife officers um, that, or call our Denver office and we can get into that, how you can reach us a little bit later. Um, and we could help you on ways that you can protect uh, your chicken coops, your beehives, your livestock. Other attractants, uh, we'll get into that in just a minute here. Um, going back to some of the behavior that escalates on our bear progression map, uh, the car break-ins, 181 across the state this, this last year, 23 in Area 1, and dwelling and garage break-ins, there was 362 across Colorado last year. 
um, that was reported to us. And those are not instances where Bear comes into an open garage. Uh, those are instances where Bear forcibly entered in to these dwellings to get the food that it can smell and smell from a, a large distance away. So now let's, let's take a look at, at area one and evergreen and, and the greater surrounding area, um, what we're looking at. So 334 reports on bears came into us from area one and that ranked as the fifth highest area among the 18 that we have in, in CPW and across Colorado. Breaking down the attractants that we saw, trash, uh, no surprise, is, is the major one there, 151 of, of those 334 reports involved trash. And that percentage was the second highest of all the areas in the state. Bird feeders had 59. And as a percentage wise, uh, area one has the highest percentage of bird feeders uh, involved as a source of conflict or attractant with bear calls that come into us. Chicken coops, we talked about the bears that get into cars. Uh, you could be your hand sanitizer. It could be your, your, your chapstick that is left in the car. Anything with a scent can, can lure a bear to come and investigate what's in there. It can smell it, same thing with your home. It can smell the food that's in there. And it's that progression, that uh, progression and a learned behavior. Your bears, when they've been rewarded by getting food from one car, you know, they'll begin to look at other cars in other homes and other garages when they escalate and they kind of lose that fear of coming around our, our neighborhoods and our, our homes. We had 36 bears that got into homes or forcibly entered into garages to get, uh, to get food rewards last year. And then we, we didn't talk about earlier, but the other attractants that aren't defined in that data set that we showed and what we particularly see in, in area one as a major sources of those pet food, people leaving pet food out on their decks, barbecue grills. Uh, you need to be sure that you clean your grills off, burn the food off after every use, clean it with ammonia, uh, use ammonia around it that you can spray as a, as a scent deterrent. So keep your grills clean. Compost lures in not just bears, but all kinds of different animals. So uh, you need to secure your, your compost. And then freezers and open garages. Uh, keeping your garage closed uh, is one step to help prevent getting them. And it's, a, it's an easy step to take, but it's something that we see very often of bears entering into open garages. So quickly, um, before we move on and, and we'll answer a lot of questions um, that we have for you, I uh, want you to let you know how you can get a hold of us. Uh, you see the, uh, the phone number for our Denver office, and that's where you can call in if you need help, if you need to report something. Um, that's the, the best place for residents in, in Evergreen and the surrounding area to get in touch with us. Uh, Monday through Friday, 8 a.m. to 5 p.m. is our hours of operation there. Um, if there is an urgent matter that requires wildlife officer um, assistance after those hours, um, then we ask that you call Colorado State Patrol and ask for the on-call wildlife officer. A couple other aspects that we have, we have an Operation Game Thief um, that is really designed more for, for poaching um, and reporting, but that is a place where you can report things and you can report it anonym, anonymously into Colorado Parks and Wildlife. And then you can also submit um, it electronically uh, through our website by using the Ask CPW uh, the Ask CPW functionality. And there's a link there for it. The easy way, if you uh, just Google Colorado Parks and Wildlife, it takes you to our homepage. We have a search option up in the top right. And if you just type in there, Ask CPW, that is a good way to submit questions into us. So at this time, I think that's it for, for the data set. And let me stop sharing my screen here. And we can start moving along to some questions here. All right, so we will bear with me for one moment. So uh, the first question that we'll go to, um, I guess real quick before that, 
continue, please continue to use the Q&A functionality to ask your questions. But the first one here um, is about how many citations issued to people each year for their trash and bird feeders. Do the courts support these tickets by issuing fines? Uh, Joe, maybe that would be a, a good one that you could address for us. Yeah, certainly. Um, I can't give you a total number. Uh, our law enforcement unit maintains those records. Um, there's seven officers, uh, district officers who work in area one. Um, so I, I don't personally know an exact number, uh, but like I said, our law enforcement uh, unit maintains those records. As far as courts, um, the citations we issue for most violations related to attracting or feeding bears, uh, we issue in the form of what's called a penalty assessment, um, which actually gives a person an ability to pay a fine and not appear in court. Um, and then after a period of time, uh, or just over two weeks, if it's not paid, it turns into a court summons, then they're required to appear to court. So I guess the first uh, important detail there is most of those tickets are not a mandatory court appearance unless somebody opts not to pay it. Um, and then in terms of citations that go to court, uh, you know, I'd say it depends a lot upon um, really kind of the caseload of the county that we're working in and then uh, individual circumstances, um, you know, uh, to be just perfectly honest, this last year with COVID, uh, our court system, you know, in the counties that I work is kind of been overloaded uh, with a backlog on cases. And, um, you know, we, we were asked to really take some thought about the citations we were issuing simply because at the end of the day, most of these are low level misdemeanor offenses and our courts are, you know, trying to handle some really uh, crimes that are a lot greater and deal with the backlog. So, um, but the best answer I can give really is it's handled on a case by case basis. You know, we follow up with our cases with the court system um, and, and then also certainly learn on, lean on other tools to help uh, get voluntary compliance from the public as well. Thank you for that. Great, thanks. Um, and Jason and I are gonna kind of team team up for the question and answer portion. So we do have another question here. Um, and this is a good one. Uh, do you have a more environmentally friendly alternative to ammonia and bleach? Um, and Barbara, as far as, far as I know, um, I'm not sure if there is something that's more um, environmentally friendly than ammonia or bleach. I know we just say like wash out your trash cans, use ammonia soaked rags to place around chicken coops, um, garbage cans window ledges, that sort of thing. So I don't know that it would have a huge amount of contact directly with the environment unless it was down on the ground um, and depending how and where you were cleaning out your trash can. Does anyone else on the panel, Jason or Joe, have uh, any thoughts or have you heard of anything that is as effective as bleach but is maybe more friendly to our environment? Uh, not necessarily, um, you know, bleach and Ammonia is what we usually suggest. I think it's maybe um, uh, more an issue of how people are using it. It could be an issue um, with the exception of electricity. I mean, anyone, most of these circumstances when you're talking about uh, trash, livestock, um, compost bins, if you will, uh, an electric fence is uh, Gonna solve the problem. I mean, it's the best permanent fix. Um, there's some cost involved, clearly, but uh, but it, but it's a great tool. So. That's a good thought, and I think too, following along those lines, it makes me think of unwelcome mats as well. So unwelcome mats are plywood boards that you um, nail nails into at certain distances, and you can put in front of a window or around a trash can. So that could be another good alternative, along with electric fencing um, as well. So thank you for that. And staying on the electric and kind of like a, a unwelcome mat, there is an electric mat that you can have made as well. Mm -hmm. um, serves the same purpose as a, um, the electric fencing or an unwelcome mat. Um, it's just that deterrent and uh, kind of a negative reinforcement to, to keep bears away from areas where you don't want them. Okay, um, moving along here. 
what sort of discussions have there been with Jeffco about a trash ordinance? Maybe uh, Officer Nicholson, can you explain a little bit about how that works? Yeah, certainly. Uh, I guess for starters, um, our agency has not had conversations with Jefferson County as a county um, putting a trash ordinance in place. Um, so uh, normally uh, it would be an outside group that would push that. Uh, if we have questions about it, you know, we're more than happy to answer them for the county. Uh, I have seen uh, community groups try to um, uh, get a trash ordinance of some sort in place in Jefferson County before, and uh, and it's not happened uh, for a lot of reasons um, that you know related to cost and manpower, um, logistics with trash companies. Uh, you know, cost to both residents and the county for that matter. But again, those those specifics specifics of it are actually county issues um, because they'd be a county ordinance. Uh, but again, that's something that really, uh, you know, the, the community would need to bring forward to the county, um, particularly it, with it being an unincorporated county. At least this west portion where we have more repair issues. So. Great. Um, okay, so it looks like we have one more question right now uh, in the Q and A. Uh, livestock conflict in Area Six seemed to be an outlier. What was the issue there? Why so high? And then there's kind of a second part to this question: Are there attractants involved with garage home um, break-ins? So I think for the first part. Um, I'll, I'll kind of give my perspective and then Joe, if you have anything to add. Um, so area six is outside of the Northeast region. So I'm not as familiar um, with what that area and what their districts would look like as far as the communities and neighborhoods that officers are working in. Um, but, you know, if it's more, a more rural community, it could just be that you have more areas that have livestock um, that could be part of it. So just kind of a quantity issue. Um, are there other attractants involved with garage home break-ins? I would say yes. Anything that really brings a bear onto a property could be considered an attractant and the bear will just make its way um, to the garage or home uh, following a scent trail or something like that. So if you had a bird feeder out and say for whatever reason, the bear couldn't necessarily get to that bird feeder, um, but it was still on your property and caught the scent of something else that's in your garage, maybe it's the trash that you store in there, um, that could certainly lead it to a break in there. Um, so Joe, anything else you could think of about area six if you're more familiar with those folks? Um, yeah, I can add just a little bit. Uh, so I, I don't know the specifics of all those situations, but I do know area six livestock production is huge, um, particularly sheep. And a lot of sheep are ran in the summer. Um, uh, on allotments where it's also bear habitat. And I know depredation on sheep in particular um, can be fairly significant there. So I would guess that uh, a fair number of those are related to that. Um, beyond that, I, I couldn't say though. I'll add one other aspect to that. Just since I've gone through and um, the last two years broken down all those reports. So I've, I've read a number of them that have come in from area six and and Joe's spot on, it's um, primarily sheep. I think in 2019, the numbers for area six, we had 168 total reports and uh, 162 of them involved livestock. Um, so that's the, the primary, it, it kind of goes to show the different areas of the state and the, the, the landscape, the use of, uh, of the landscape um, and how those bear conflicts take place. So uh, they're not the same across the state and area six is, is a very good example for that. So I think we could, uh, thank you, Brian, for, for that question. And we will move on to the next one here, uh, which is, would you be willing to do a Zoom with my bearware group to give us talking points to bring to the county for an ordinance. Uh, Barb, thank you for the question. Uh, yes, those things that, 
that we can come on. We, we've done some others before, um, so we can maybe talk offline of, about how to make that happen, but um, we could definitely uh, chat with your bear aware group um, and give some pointers. I don't know, Lori, is there anything you want to add a little bit on the subject? Um, as far as the ordinance or the Zoom? Talking points for, for their bear aware group that they're forming. Um, as far as we can certainly provide details about what CPW volunteers do for CPW when they go out into neighborhoods. As Jennifer mentioned in her graphic where Colorado Parks and Wildlife can intervene sooner in that chain, that's where volunteers come in. They go out and canvas neighborhoods and provide door hangers and speak to their community about trash and bird feeders and what to do. So I'm happy to connect with you about what our volunteers do so that we can maybe be on the same page. Okay, great. Uh, thanks for that, Lori. Uh, so moving on to our next question. Uh, so many new folks who have no idea about bears, trash, outside pet foods, uh, suggestions for getting information out to these folks. Um, so that's a great question. And um, over the last couple of years, Colorado Parks and Wildlife has really been trying to push onto um, social media, especially. So Jason has done a ton of good work um, with Twitter feeds and Facebook and um, Nextdoor. And so we can certainly use um, outlets that way. We do have videos we can post. Um, you know, things like that. We're happy to mail out any information as well. Um, we have brochures about everything about living responsibly with bears, um, all the way from hiking and camping to how to bear proof your home, um, deterrence. So if you want to learn how to build a bear on welcome mat, um, if you want to learn how to put up an electric fence, uh, we can share all of that. Um, I would also maybe suggest if you know a local retailer or not retailers, but um, realtors there we go that's the word um but we're certainly happy to give them information as well so the folks that would have direct contact with your new folks um there are some areas along the front range that work with their realtors for things like neighborhood welcome packets um or if you're in an hoa um, or you have uh, like groups like this one who would be willing to or could connect with people in your community um, we can certainly help support that way so jason anything else you'd like to add there about reaching out to folks well, education is has got to be continuous, um, and so again, we, we highly suggest that that people give us a call and let us know what's going on in their uh, community, in their neighborhood. Um, and the earlier that we get involved, uh, the better, or the more tools that we have uh, to curb small problems from going into big problems. But again, use the online resources that we have. Uh, we try to like Jennifer mentioned, try to reach out uh, strongly uh, with social media presence and, and uh, work with, with media groups um, to uh, we get great media coverage specifically as it comes to bears. Um, and a lot of that comes from, from the Denver market, but that should reach up your way. Um, so it's gotta be a continuous effort. Um, and it, you know, the other thing too is it takes a community wide effort for, for problems to um, improve. So if I'm doing one thing right, but my neighbors have trash and bird feeders um, or other attractants out, then there's gonna be issues. So uh, don't be afraid to, to talk with your neighbors too as, as well. That's a great point. And um, before I move to the next question, I just wanna take another opportunity to, to remind folks that um, simply calling and reporting a bear does not mean that bear is gonna be put down. Um, and that gives us the opportunity to do all of this education, to do all of this outreach before that bear progresses into dangerous behavior. Um, so please remember that if you see something going on on your own property with neighbors, call us and let us know so that we can do the outreach and get that bear's behavior turned around um, and also change the behavior of your, your human neighbors as well. So. And one more along those lines is, you know, it's important that we haze bears away. Uh, if you see bears that, that are coming around, um, it could be something simple, uh, setting off the car alarm uh, by the panic key 
um, having that go off, banging pots and pans together, keeping an air horn in your house and blowing that, uh, doing something so bears aren't comfortable going through right through your backyard. And if some of those tactics, tactics don't work, then that's another great time to give us a call and uh, we can get you in contact with wildlife officers who can maybe go over some other tactics uh, that are maybe a little more aggressive to help to prevent that bear from becoming habituated. We will keep moving along here with questions. Um, and this one's coming from Chrissy. What determines when CPW will be directly involved in any particular bear issue? Uh, maybe Officer Nicholson, you wanna tackle that one? Um, it's a pretty broad question. I, I guess for starters, one, if we're contacted. So uh, regarding a bear conflict, if our agency gets contacted, I mean, we're gonna be involved. It's just a question of what the issue is. So. You know, whether that be a bear that's depredating on livestock, um, you know, whether it's a back, backyard chickens or goats or, uh, or somebody with bees, you know, there's a lot of tools we have along with education um, to help folks in that situation. Um, you know, um, if it's a public safety issue, certainly, if a bear's broken into a home or been aggressive with people, absolutely, we're gonna be involved. You know, I, I guess truly, if our phone, if we get a phone call, we're going to be involved. That, you know, what level we're involved at really depends upon uh, the circumstances of that situation. So, um, to me, probably the biggest thing is just don't be afraid to pick up the phone and call. Uh, it, it, it's all too common. I find that we don't get a phone call until a problem has persisted for quite some time which means that bear has had an extended period of time to learn and then re, you know, reinforce bad behaviors. And uh, bears are extraordinarily intelligent. Um, you know, and once they learn those bad behaviors and been rewarded for them repeatedly, it's increasingly difficult to change that. So um, the sooner we have an opportunity to intervene, the better. Um, and then I guess one other thing uh, less related to our agency or, or our officer's involvement is kind of going back to a question about, um, you know, new people moving to Evergreen is don't hesitate, just be a good neighbor. Uh, you know, I, COVID is throwing a monkey wrench into this, if you will, but um, just some good old fashioned actually knocking on a door and talking with a neighbor and not so much in a lecturing fashion, but just being a good neighbor and sharing information can go a long way. Uh, something I've seen over the years um, that can create some friction between neighbors is when somebody calls us and then an officer shows up at a neighbor's home and uh, there's never actually been a conversation between neighbors. Over the years, I've certainly seen neighbors kind of develop friction between each other that probably could have been avoided with just a friendly conversation first. Now, if that doesn't happen or there's already, you know, other reasons somebody doesn't want to talk, certainly call us. That's what we're here for. Um, but don't forget the power of just a smile and being willing to be a good neighbor. Um, you know, people value that. You have to live with your neighbors. So. Great. Thank you. Um, and Jason, this next question is for you directly. Um, and the question is, do these area numbers fluctuate a lot from year to year or are certain areas consistently having issues? So the data that, that you saw is coming from a new reporting system that we have that kind of brought the whole state into uh, a streamlined and one reporting database. Um, in the past, before 2019 is when this new um, our new tracking system went into action. In the past, there was some uh, different regions had, had done some different tracking. Um, so um, it was, it's going to be kind of hard to compare apples to apples, what we are seeing in 2019 and 2020 to the years previously before that. Um, this new tool is, is very beneficial to us. And as we get three, four more years in, then I think we can really 
begin to analyze on an area to area basis um, what the fluctuations are is you know something increasing um you know has there been actions taken that things are improving in the community so brian that's a, a little bit about the tracking system um but things fluctuate naturally uh year to year anyways and and going back to jennifer's presentation uh there are natural causes that that could cause that if we have a late freeze in the spring that could maybe have a crop cause a, a crop failure um so there are natural aspects uh drought in our environment too that that does can increase bear activity if their natural food sources aren't there then they very well be could, could be coming into our neighborhoods looking for others uh bears got to find the calorie it's a calorie game to them and so um, there are other aspects that go into it but uh, we'll see we're, we'll see where the trends go but this new uh reporting system has been a, a great tool for us um Okay, we got another question on rec recommendations for hiking safety, uh, best deterrence. Um, I guess I, I could maybe take the first stab and then if anyone else has anything to add, but um, make noise as you go is, is a, a great recommendation. Uh, hike with a buddy out there. A lot of times, uh, whether it's a bear, whether it's a mountain lion, other wildlife, if you're making noise as you go, those animals will hear you in advance and, and get out of the way, most likely before you even encounter them. So that's one aspect. Don't go out hiking with uh, or, or biking or any of that with uh, earbuds in. You know, be able to hear and be aware of your surroundings, what's going on. Um, and if you have those earbuds in, a lot of times you can miss some cues of what's going on in the in nature around you. Um, if you want to talk about other deterrents, um, you can keep bear spray on you. Bear spray is an effective tool. Uh, it does require you to kind of be a close encounter if you're going to use that. I think the recommended distance is, is probably 25 feet, if I remember right off the top of my head. Um, and you got to be very aware of where the wind is coming if you're going to go use bear spray. You don't want to use it where that you spray it and the wind could blow it right back into you. So be very aware with that. Uh, you could keep a whistle, other ways to make loud noises. Um, if you do encounter a bear, don't ever run from it. You want to remain calm. You want to face the bear. Uh, you want to talk to it and most talk to it, make noise. Most times that bear will identify what you are and will move away on its own. If bear shows signs of aggression or doesn't want to, to go away, um, you know, again, you need to keep yelling at that bear. Do not run. You can try to back away from it slowly. You never want to trap a bear, so you always want to give it an escape route. Maybe you can step to the downhill side and, and get away from, from that bear. Um, and in, in the case, if there's ever an attack, you need to fight back and fight back with everything that you got. It could be anything you have around you. could be your keys. could be some branches. Um, one aspect I, I think I did miss too is you want to make yourself look bigger. Um, so if you have a jacket, you can open up your jacket, you can wave your arms around. Um, so those are some things. We have a lot of great online resources too uh, for recommendations for hiking, camping, and, and bear country and, and what you can do. So we can encourage you to, to go to those aspects. Um, okay, and it looks like our last question um, is, is there a bearware group in Evergreen? And I believe um, we may mention this earlier, currently, as far as Colorado Parks and Wildlife goes, we do not have a bearware group in Evergreen. Um, and Lori, I don't know if you know the history or Joe a little bit more than I do, um, when we last had a bearware team in Evergreen. Um, yeah, we actually do have a small group of awesome volunteers that okay. are still considered bear aware, but I don't think they're actively sent out to neighborhoods to canvas, but they do go to a couple different events that I can think of in Evergreen, um, Evergreen Outdoor Skills Day, which we've held in the past around mid-June, around sometime June, and then there's a chili cook-off that they set up a table with skins and skulls and talk about bear issues in the community. So other than setting up tables and having the public approach them, I don't believe we've actively sent them out into neighborhoods as a true bear aware 
team to Canvas. Thanks, Lori. And I and I would say too, probably with um, the you know the the pandemic, of course, is still ongoing. We all already know that. Um, expected to go, you know, probably till the end of this year is really really what I've heard. Um, and I. I don't believe we have any plans right now to recruit volunteers anywhere at the moment. So um, all of that is kind of on hold right now. Okay, well, thank you, Jennifer and Lori for that question. Um, so we're at 7.03 right now, we're just a little bit over. Um, I'd like to respect everyone's time and um, I think we'll end this right now, but we hope that you found that this was uh, beneficial for you and things that we can do uh, in the future too. Again, the educational effort needs to be uh, constant and that's one aspect that, that we try to focus on. So uh, go back, you can give us a call, give our Denver office a call if you have questions or visit us online at cpw.state.co.us and find the educational materials there. So uh, this is gonna be posted up on, on YouTube. So you can look for it there. Or if you had friends who missed it, who would like to come back, um, they'll be able to access it there. So thank you to everyone who, who joined us tonight and thank you to our panelists. And we hope everyone has a good spring and, and is bear aware. So thank you. Thanks everyone. Thank you for your time.